Okay, welcome everyone to this webinar about the current state of the Republican Party, the second impeachment trial of former President Trump, and the future of the party. I would like to encourage all viewers of this webinar to send me your questions through the Q&A function here on Zoom, or as comments on our live stream on Facebook, uh, and we will bring up as many of them as possible during this hour. We are very happy and honored to have today's speakers with us, and I would like to warmly welcome Colin Dweck, who is a professor in the Schar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University, and a non-resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and also Professor Theda Skokpol, Victor S. Thomas Professor of Government and Sociology at Harvard University. My name is Ilma Peterson, and I work here at the, uh, at the Institute as a program manager. So skipping to uh, my first question, and uh, with the fear of what you're going to tell me now, I will try to figure out what to do with the remaining 57 minutes. But do you think that it is uh, time or too soon to talk about the future of the party? Theda, would you like to start? Well, it's never too soon to talk about it, but you know, um, I have to say commentators are, uh, and, and political scientists like myself ha are, have not proved to be very good about predicting the future. So I think what we can do is to point to the forces at work that may define the possible alternatives. If we go back to 2015 and 2016, there were not very many people out there who thought that Donald Trump could become the nominee of the Republican Party. Um, and I think in retrospect, uh, there are things that make sense of why he was able to do it, including the fact that by that point, the Republican Party had been pulled very far to the free market right by the coconut work and other organized um, wealthy uh, ideological and donor forces. And I don't mean simply by giving checks. Our own work shows that the party had been pulled to the right by um, local, state, and national action that influenced the kinds of issues, tax cuts, cuts in government regulation, efforts to break up uh, public sector unions that viable Republican candidates were using in that period under Barack Obama's presidency. But there was another radicalizing force bubbling up all along, and that was the Tea Party movement, which had grassroots components. I mean, our research group thinks about two to 3,000 local Tea Parties spread all over the United States and particularly dense in swing districts and in Republican uh, districts in the Congress. And the priorities for many grassroots Tea Partiers were immigration restriction and um, pushing back against the rise of um, younger, more racially and ethnically diverse uh, forces in American society. That's what Barack Obama symbolized for many of them and they found it very frightening. So Donald Trump came along and he said out loud what most Republican establishment types, particularly those pursuing free market agendas had tried to, to just hint at which is that he was going to champion um, uh, ethno-nationalist restrictions, um, that he was also going to respond um, robustly to Christian right nationalist concerns, which had also been a strong force at the grassroots of the Republican Party for some time. And lo and behold, um, he rose in the primaries and he defeated all of the um, long-standing, uh, experienced government uh, candidate types, uh, including governors. Uh, I think at that point, a lot of people thought, well, there'll be this uneasy coexistence and it'll result in uh, Trump uh, signing the bills that Mitch McConnell, the Senate uh, ma Majority Leader, sends him. Uh, and that proved to be true in many ways. I mean, there was the, the huge tax cuts tilted toward the wealthy regulatory cuts. Uh, my own research suggests that a lot of wealthy free marketers did not like immigration restrictions, but they, they thought that was the price of um, getting what they wanted, particularly judges uh, for the federal judiciary. But Donald Trump was supposed to do all that and then fade away. Now, the uh, thing is, he hasn't. Uh, in many ways, the full-throated, in-your-face, 
anti-liberal ethno-nationalism that he champions is, has taken over the activist voting core of the Republican Party. And Trump and people around him have actively taken over local and state parties across the country. So um, when we get to the 2020 election and Trump refuses to step back, um, even after the Electoral College has registered the votes, uh, then you see the marriage of convenience between the free marketers uh, and the ethno-nationalists begin to come apart. And that is now symbolized in the clash between those Republicans who either voted to impeach Donald Trump and convict him, that's a very small number of elected Republicans, but the larger number who, who agree with Mitch McConnell's condemnation of the violent turn that the Trump election victory uh, Biden, uh, denial of Biden's election victory took at the end on January 6th. And uh, there is now a civil war going on and it will keep going on. It's a very one-sided civil war because many grassroots people who still call themselves Republicans, a fair number have redefined themselves as independents, uh, are very, very thrilled by and loyal to Donald Trump. Um, and when he makes a call going forward, as he apparently will, to go after those Republicans who have, uh, have not been 1,000% celebratory toward him, even as he, his followers turn to violence, I think you're going to see a continuing fight going into 2022 and 2024. And those are crucial elections, because long and short of it is that in most places, not all, Republican candidates, particularly for the Senate, need to put together Trump voters with um, what I call business Republicans of various stripes. And that's going to be hard to do um, if the issue is forced again and again in raucous public fights. So that's where we are right now. It looks like those fights are gonna play out and it's very hard to say, but I'll say one final thing. The US system is a two party system. It is not the case that the Republican party is going away or is going to fall apart. There are so many forces that make it almost impossible for that to happen over a short period of time. Trump is not gonna start a third party. He's too lazy to do that. And he doesn't need to do that because he controls a lot of, of forces in the organizational structure and voting base of the Republican Party as it now exists. So that means that there remains a strong probability that the Republican Party will recapture the House, the Senate, and or the presidency in the near future. Um, it's going to be uh, difficult, but a lot depends on whether the Democrats blow it in various ways that they're perfectly capable of doing. Um, going into the coming elections. Trump actually, is in office, but Trumpism is not gone. You've actually mentioned a lot of things that I want to come back to a little bit later. But I also want to ask the question to Colin, if you think that this is the right time to talk about the future of the party. No, I think it's a great time to talk about it. Um, and I actually agree with, with some of what Dr. Scotchpool just said. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Call me Theta. Theta. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> So I think where we would agree is to say that Trump, in some ways, uh, was an effect as well as a cause. There has been a long-term shift in the Republican Party toward a more working class base. If you go back to the party in the 50s, I mean, it was basically the party of respectable upper middle class, college educated northerners. And that's almost flipped over the years um, in partisan terms. So that's going to have policy effects. Trump accelerated it. Some people have left the party. You know, you see neighborhoods in suburban Atlanta, suburban Dallas that we never would have thought would vote Democrat, but that have in recent years. And yet there are people, white working class men in the Rust Belt famously voted for Trump in 2016. And, and that's, that's, that's of interest. Um, so th there are serious policy implications of all this on foreign policy, which is my special area of interest as well as on domestic. For example, a more nationalist Republican party is going to be more protectionist, right? There's there's more of a support for trade 
protection as opposed to free trade. And that battle, I think, is, is not going away. There's powerful forces on both sides. And actually, the balance of opinion in the party hasn't shifted all that much. There's a lot of ambivalence about globalization. Trump tapped into that. Uh, I can tell you from having worked on other Republican campaigns over the years that we just, not, we just did not realize how much strong support there was for protective tariffs at the base of the party among the more blue collar Republicans. And that's, that is now a revelation and everybody's seen it. And, and so we're, we're in a different era now. Um, on fiscal issues, the core Trump supporters are, uh, as Theta just said, le a lot less orthodox, right? National debt and deficits is not a big problem. Support maintain social security is actually something Trump ran on. That is not the kind of Paul Ryan tradition of you know balanced budgets, hopefully balanced budgets and fiscal conservatism and so on. Um, and then on foreign policy, you know, you have a president with Trump who famously did not uh, want to start any new military interventions, which is actually kind of interesting. So uh, this is a less interventionist wing of the party that that expressed itself through his candidacy. As, as strange as he is. And, you know, he, he seemed to recognize that. Uh, in some ways he was pretty hawkish more than say a Rand, Senator Rand Paul would have liked, but he clearly, Trump clearly wants, wanted to get out of Afghanistan, um, had little interest in places like Syria, wanted to bring US troops home from Germany and South Korea. So that's a different wing of the party. That's not the beltway establishment wing, you know, at all. So there's precedent for all of this. It's not completely unprecedented. On foreign policy, for example, there's a long-standing Republican tradition, Republican foreign policy tradition of, of a more nationalist or non-interventionist strain. And those battles in the 40s and 50s, early 50s were, were colossal, but eventually the internationalist wing won the fight um, under Eisenhower. And we thought that that fight was over, right? You had sort of marginal figures like a Pat Buchanan or a Ron Paul in the 90s. Nobody seriously thought they could become president what Trump did, amazingly enough, was to combine some of the arguments that those people made with then kind of a Ross Perot, uh, let's just get under the hood and fix the car. You know, I'm a, I'm a practical businessman. Let's roll, roll up our sleeves and fix the problem. Combining all that together at, at the right moment, the right candidate at the right time managed amazingly to, to win the whole thing. So that, that really was, I think, unexpected. But, but now we're in a different world. And Trump sort of blew the lid off a lot of traditional Republican orthodoxies. And you cannot put the lid back on. I mean, the, the debate is now underway as to what should Republican foreign policy be? What should Republican fiscal policy be? What should Republican trade policy be? You know, these are open questions. And, and um, it's interesting, it's of substance. They're of real substantive interest to people. Um, at the same time, it is still the more conservative party of the two, clearly in relation to the Democrats. There are some issues where there actually isn't much disagreement among Republicans. I mean, the vast majority, whether Trump supporters or establishment types like to see conservative judges, for example, uh, tend to be more culturally conservative or at least center right. So there's actually a mixture of commonalities uh, along with some differences. And we've seen that over the years within Republican party debates during the Trump era. It's gonna continue, I think. So. The press tends to focus on the most sensational, the most personalistic, the most, the most scandalous elements. And there's always a lot to talk about these days. But I just would want to highlight for your audience that there are serious debates going on as to what Republican policy should be moving ahead on basic public policy matters. And Trump unintentionally, I think, served the purpose of opening up that space. And now the debate is on. Actually, I wanted to uh, turn to the um, impeachment trial, but actually, but then I changed my mind from what you just said, uh, because we mentioned in the invitation to this webinar that there was no uh, electoral platform in 2020. Instead, uh, a statement of support for the president was issued. Um, where where is this now? Uh, I mean, this this is what you just talked about the policies that the the party would like to see. Um, you know, I understand that there are serious intellectuals and policy analysts around the Republican Party. And I'm sure they are debating all of the issues that Colin uh, laid out. I don't think that the Republican Party is being driven by policy debates at this time. I really don't. 
Um, so I, res I respectfully disagree with that. I think the fact that no platform was drawn up and that um, as president, Donald Trump was rarely consistent in any line of policymaking with the arguable exception of immigration restriction and cutting off refugee flows. Uh, even in the trade policy area, he oscillated a fair amount, depending on whether he particularly liked the country involved at a given time. Um, and I think the Democratic Party, and we really can't talk about one party without talking about the other, the Democratic Party under at least Biden is not going to be re-embracing free market internationalism in any uh, quick way at all. I think there's an understanding among Democrats that um, both parties paid too little attention to the social and community disruptions created by a free trade regime and also the pandemic's effect on the world economy and on ties is really <clears throat> yet to be understood and explored. So I think you're gonna see Biden's presidency uh, cautiously maintaining some of the lines of foreign policy and economic policy change that uh, Trump imposed on often reluctant um, elected Republican office holders. Um, so in a way that won't really create a lot of space uh, for uh, a policy response. You know, I interview grassroots Republican people, Tea Party people, Trump supporters, and frankly, they get passionate when they talk about the wall and when they talk about Trump's persona and his style of politics. Uh, it is not a very policy-oriented debate for many people at the grassroots. So my take on that, Ilva, would be, um, yes. I think there's no doubt that, that um, for a good many grassroots Republicans that for several years now, it's Trump himself, among other things, who has excited their support. I mean, I live in a rural, I'm looking out the window here, I live in a rural county in Virginia where, where uh, the, the county went strongly for Trump uh, both times he ran for president 2016 and 2020. I, I, a lot of my neighbors and friends actually would fall in that category. It's, it's controversial, but they, uh, they actually talk in much the same way that Theta uh, just suggested. So yeah, Trump personally excited a, a good percentage of Republicans from the start with the sense that he was a fighter, he was an outsider, he was something different, he was not a career politician. He spoke his mind. I mean, this is how they talk about it, right? If you're a Trump yeah, supporter. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, uh, you know, he's just something special and unusual from their point of view, as hard as that is to believe in, in kind of a, you know, postgraduate environment where there's next to 0% of people who, who feel that way. So that's absolutely true. And I think it overlaps with the, the policy concerns that are out there. And that's what makes it so tricky and complicated to analyze and talk about is that it is obviously the case that the vast majority of Republican voters to this day, even after January 6th, like Trump, support Trump, hope that he sticks around as a major force, do not wanna see him impeached, resent critiques or attacks on him by Republicans like McConnell or, or others. I mean, that's just the reality. So on one level, you've got an interesting policy debate going on. On another level, as Theta says, you have, I wouldn't even really say it's much of a civil war. You have the vast majority, really. I mean, if it's a civil war, I mean, it's not much of a battle. Uh, right. We thought for a moment after, after the 6th of January that maybe um, there would be more of a response from a kind of critical mass of congressional Republicans. And of course you did get seven senators and 10, I think it was 10 representatives yeah, right. yeah, yeah. to impeach Trump. But you know, the vast majority, know exactly what the base of the Republican Party feels and thinks on this issue. And that's why you had overwhelming majorities in the end vote not to impeach uh, or convict Donald Trump. I mean, it's just that simple. So, so here we are. We're, we're in a party where you've got interesting, lively, open debates on policy. But at the same time, 
overwhelming popular feeling at the base in favor of Donald Trump. And maybe, and I don't think we know whether Trump himself in the kind of kingmaker role that he is now embracing, will be able to transfer his uh, charisma to others. I have my doubts about that. I think the record we have so far suggests that as an electoral politician, Trump excites his opponents even more than he excites his supporters. And that matters less than it might seem to matter for the Republican Party because the US system is an electoral college system, a Senate system, that, and a, even a House system that gives disproportionate weight to the non-metropolitan areas. Uh, they're not rural, a lot of them. Many of them are exurban or um, small town, small city centered areas, but they have disproportionate weight, even without gerrymandering. And then when you put gerrymandering in there, they have even more disproportionate weight in the selection of state legislatures, in the, in, in the selection of, of, of Congress and, and the Senate. And so, you know, that's a big advantage that Republicans have built in. But there still are going to be statewide races, uh, both for the presidency and the Senate and suburban swing districts, many of which the Democrats gave back in this cycle uh, are going to be contested again where, you know, the quarter of Republicans or 20% of Republican identifiers who, who are not Trump idolaters, um, and not to mention the, the independents, Republican-leaning independents who have, who were horrified by January 6th, frankly, um, they're going to factor in too. So to the degree that the fight over Trump personally and loyalty to Trump personally remains front and center, that creates problems for Republicans going forward. Even if, even if, even if, as, as Colin points out, the Civil War itself is over <laughs> in many ways, it's just that the losers are still there and their votes are still needed. So the, the, that's how I would put that. And I think the most significant congressional vote was the vote over Liz Cheney which was a secret ballot. And you saw two thirds, even in the House, which is by far the more radicalized pro-Trump, a set of elected politicians in the Republican party, two thirds of them voted to retain her. So that suggests that there's a group in there that is not willing to go public with doubts about whether Trump alone is the future of the Republican party but aren't prepared to go all the way either with throwing overboard uh, those Republicans. Like Liz Cheney could not be more conservative on policy questions. So, you know, that, that really is to me the more telling vote than the, I never thought the impeachment voter and uh, conviction vote was going to, to succeed in removing Trump from office. That's or from um, election eligibility. That just wasn't in the cards. Yeah, and Colin, you mentioned previously that the, the majority of the uh, Republican voters actually support Trump. What do you think were the conclusions that were drawn from the impeachment, the second impe impeachment trial from the party side? Well, um, are you talking about at the top of the party or? or yeah. OK, um, so I think. Or if anywhere else is more relevant to talk about them, <laughs> please feel free yeah. to. I think, look, frankly, a lot of people were waiting to see if that would be the mo if January 6th would be the moment where finally his support cracked, right? I mean, it, it was amazing how rock solid his support was for four years through all the controversies. It was just, he was just bulletproof as he himself said. And then there was a feeling maybe January 6th was, went so far that that support would finally crack. And there was a little bit of erosion, but you know, it's, it amounts to instead of 90% of voters saying they, Republican voters saying they support him, it's 80%. You know, so in practical terms, politically, if you're if you're a House member who you know wants to stay in office and is concerned about your your future, uh, are you going to be primaried on a matter that really does concern your average Republican, which is the impeachment of Donald Trump? Then the vote politically is pretty straightforward, right? So I mean, people like Cheney took a very brave stance. It seems to me. I mean, she's in trouble. 
she could easily be primary um, next year. But I mean, she clearly believed that this was just outrageous and something had to be said and done about it. So, you know, that's why you only have 10 uh, instead, of, instead of more voting, voting to impeach. But as Theta just said, there are a lot of House members, kind of more regular Republican types who, um, you know, privately would, would be gr grinding their teeth at what's happened, but are not going to vote to impeach him. So just looking ahead to pick up on a theme that's come up, you know, Trump may not be, the, Trump himself personally may not be the future of the party. I think he has, he has encouraged changes that actually will last, but it is very much up in the air. And as far as himself personally, as Theta said, uh, there's nothing to say that he will be the nominee three, three and a half years from now, that he will continue to be as domineering a force then as he is now. I mean, the fact that voters say on the Republican side that they support him doesn't mean they will necessarily nominate him again. I think it's important for your viewers to understand that, you know, people may very well move on. This is hard to predict. I mean, we're, we shouldn't, I'm a little bit skeptical of, of those analysts who uh, would say, well, I know for a fact that he's the nominee in 2024, or yeah. I know for a fact that he isn't. As Theta began by saying, we're not that good at predicting. And I think a little humility is in order. So you know, there's a lot of possibilities. He's, he's clearly this, this major force out there. But um, if I had to guess, I would say actually that Republicans nominate somebody else, but that the Trump factor inside the party continues to be a major, major factor for that person. Not because he's going to rush off necessarily and create a third party, but because the threat of it, because the numbers involved behind him of voters who who might be tempted to vote for such a third party is taken very seriously. Ada, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, you know, I don't think there is a threat of a third party. I, it's so hard to create a third party. And um, I, you know, I don't think that Trump's personal qualities are all that matter, but they do matter somewhat. And there's two personal uh, qualities that I would point to as something we should factor into our thinking through of the possibilities. One is that he's actually lazy. Um, you know, he could have accomplished a lot more as president if he had not been spending most of his day watching TV. Uh, so it, the idea that he or even people prepared to work with him now would go through all of the effort needed to create a third party, especially since it doesn't immediately lead to success usually when people do do that. I don't see that. And I also don't see why he needs to do it since I think he remains a major kingmaker and he's showing that I am willing to predict. He is showing signs of wanting to be a kingmaker in the Republican party. He has money, he has the ability to raise money. He has the enthusiastic loyalty, not just of voters, but of state parties that have been remade under his presidency. So, uh, he didn't do it, but people around him did. And they purged doubters from the Republican Party in state after state, not all of them, but, but most of them. And so that's why you see these county committees and these state committees voting to condemn perfectly viable Republicans who have shown less than 1,000% loyalty during these, uh, these peri this period, uh, not just on the impeachment votes, but on, the, on whether to, like Nikki Haley, to question uh, whether Trump was appropriate in denying the outcome of the election, which by the way, he is still doing. And people who visit him still come away saying, well, he didn't really, maybe he didn't really lose. And, uh, you know, so that, um, that kind of aggressive, wishful thinking conspiracy thing is going forward and Trump is going to use it to raise money and to designate people to run in Republican primaries. And that is a danger to the Republican Party. I don't you know, care whether you like it or you don't like it. it. It will continue to put front and center for Republican candidates, whether they need to go with their primary voters or with the kind of fudging of the issues that smart politicians in America do if they wanna win the general election. That won't be true in all the districts or all the states, but it will be, it's not gonna be a problem in Alabama. But it will be a problem in suburban swing districts for the House. It will be a problem in um, Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, even in Ohio, 
uh, where and North Carolina, where there are critical Senate battles coming up, even in 2022. So I think we can already say that because Donald Trump is all about himself, he is not a public goods oriented person. That wasn't that was the case for the United States as a whole. It is definitely the case for the Republican Party as a whole. He's about Donald Trump. And so that's a tricky kind of, uh, as Lindsey Graham puts it, Lindsey Graham is kind of ridiculous, but he sometimes puts his finger on it. He's a handful. Well, yeah, he is. And he's not going to necessarily be a politician who's going to say, well, I need to think about my legacy rather than myself. Uh, I too agree. He's unlikely to run in 2024, or at least unlikely to, well, if he runs, he'll win. But if he, I don't think he's going to run. But, but he's not going to tell us that until 2023. <laughs> Rita, I want to go back. I have a question from the audience, and I want to tie it into one of my own questions uh, to what you said earlier. Is it viable um, as a strategy to focus so much on the ethno-nationalist vote for the party? Uh, do they not have demography against them? And I wanted to bring up also what you mentioned, Colin, about the, the shift into blue-collar um, worker support. What would you say, Theda? Well, first of all, I mean, when we talk about blue collar workers in America, I think we have to remember that increasingly they are black and brown people. Uh, and I think the core of Trump's support includes non-college credentialed people, but that's not always the same as blue collar workers. I think we tend to imagine that it's displaced factory workers. And there's a lot of that. I mean, there are, I've studied the state of Pennsylvania in great detail and you know, you can look at the area around Erie, Pennsylvania, or around Wilkes-Barre uh, and Hazleton, Pennsylvania, Luzerne County, and you can definitely see that the kind of decayed blue-collar situation and uh, ha and anger about immigration has definitely interacted to produce strong and probably persistent Trump support. But in a lot of places, it's kind of construction um, company owners. Um, various uh, lower level white collar people um, who are often passionate Trump supporters uh, and, and including many middle class people who feel that he has defended their understanding of Christian identity in the United States, which I wanna stress is not the only understanding of Christian identity involved in American politics. Uh, Christian motivated people are involved in uh, liberal politics and anti-Trump politics as well. So it's, but there's so many denominations and so many uh, church dynamics out there. Uh, and you have to get right down to it to understand some of those. So I just wanna say that that, that, uh, that means that uh, you, you have to, to, to factor in all of those concerns. I think that the people worried about cultural and ethnic and racial change and generational change in the United States are numerous. They are located in places where they are connected to one another and they have disproportionate electoral clout. But I think the focus on immigration alone is a loser. And I'll, I'll, I'll just say why in my travels to Trump areas, I have often found very conservative minded people who are quite troubled about attacks on immigrants if they know them as neighbors and as co-workers and that's the case in much of many places including in rural america or if they are familiar with refugees with refugee programs which in the united states are small and tightly controlled so they are often Christian-minded people who cannot accept the attacks on, on, on those vulnerable categories of people. So that splits the Trump base. It doesn't unite it. And I, I, you, know, you saw in 2018 in the midterm elections, the constant talk about the caravans approaching from Central America, et cetera. I don't think that really net helped very much. Um, uh, in lots and lots of areas, particularly suburban swing districts, that probably lost 
Republicans more votes than it gained. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I think Trump himself, because of his advisors, is going to be inclined to go with the hardest nosed of the anti-immigrant stuff. I think we're going to hear that starting next Sunday at CPAC. But I don't think that's a winner for conservative Republicans, even pro-Trump conservative Republicans, in many um, uh, of the elections that they're actually going to have to fight in coming years. Colin, do you want to comment on the changing demographic base of the Republican Party? Sure, yeah. I mean, so what Trump showed in 2016 was that he was able to create a lane within the Republican Party that we didn't even know existed. I mean, if you think back five years, we used to think of it as there's kind of an establishment lane. Maybe there's a Tea Party lane, which at the time meant fiscal conservative, actually. Um, there was a evangelical lane. There, Trump identified something completely different, which was an emphasis on um, tight restrictions on immigration, um, non-intervention in foreign policy, you know, actually not especially conservative on fiscal issues and um, protectionist and, and more of a non-college educated tone and style and, and substance, right? Uh, so, you know, that was, he, he sort of, as a natural politician in a way, instinctively, he identified and then activated this lane. And then the most of the rest of the Republican party went along with it. And to most people's surprise, he managed to defeat Hillary Clinton in the in the electoral college vote, although not in the popular vote. So, just from a coldly calculating point of view, the question's always been: Does that coalition win you more votes than it loses? Now, because we have an electoral college, as Theta said, it actually can win. I mean, it did win, in fact, the first time. So, you you carve out small margins of victory in Rust Belt states. You lose a certain percentage of suburbanites, moderates. Um, college educated women and so on. Although he actually didn't really do any worse among Latino voters than Romney. Um, so That's that was true. the trade-off, right? I mean, he that was a trade-off. The expectation was obviously this guy's gonna lose, he's outrageous, but he won. And then, you know, 2020, of course, has a different outcome for lots of reasons. It's a different set of issues. You have the coronavirus, um, you have this massive economic downturn. And, and I think a certain percentage of people in the middle were just fed up with Trump by that time on a, on a very personal level. But that Trump coalition is now, you know, the base of the party. So then the, the challenge that every intelligent Republican faces, I mean, McConnell is not stupid, right? Is how do you hold on to that base? It's a new, it's a new coalition with a new set of issues. And at the same time, win back uh, at least some percentage of, of suburbanites, moderates, independents to, to carve out, to carve out wins in the Senate and the House and on policy issues, you know, that's the challenge. And I, I think if there was an easy answer to it, these people would have found it. As I say, McConnell, McConnell's highly intelligent, but it might be that there is no easy solution. This is going to be a continuing grinding challenge and dilemma for Republicans at the federal and state level moving ahead. And we just will not know, and you know, how that problem is going to be solved from a party point of view until it is. It may not be solved for years. It may be that it bedevils the Republican party for years to come. We just don't know yet. All right, so um, I wanted to bring up the, the issue of the increasing rift that we see within the party between Trump and McConnell. And I have a question from the audience wondering where Mitch McConnell is heading. Um, but then, uh, you would, you, would you say that it's, uh, it's a case of trying to gain, uh, keep the voters that uh, Trump gained for the party and also um, regain some of the other older or previous voters, Colin. Well, what is this rift about? Yeah, I think in a way that's what, that was the answer I just gave. So um, maybe to expand on a little bit, you could say that McConnell probably assumed once Trump lost the election that that Mitch McConnell, not Donald Trump, would be the most important Republican in the country, right? And and to his surprise, uh, Trump continues to be, in some ways, this this overshadowing presence, which which makes it harder to conduct everyday business. He's off Twitter, of course. Trump is, but he's still out there. And whenever there's a public spat between the two of them, you know where the base of the party is going to going to go. Um, McConnell is somebody on policy who has a long list of more orthodox conservative 
priorities. He's been very skillful over the years in trying to shepherd those through, keep his caucus together, keep the party together. Uh, he's pretty good at it. Uh, but um, as I say, he's in this situation that just structurally doesn't have an obvious answer. So I think that helps to explain why he's done what he's done. I mean, on the one hand, his, his speech, the very same speech in which he indicated that he would not vote to convict was absolutely withering on, on Trump, against Trump. I mean, it was, a, it was a withering condemnation of Trump's behavior. And yet McConnell voted to acquit, right? I mean, that sums it up. Seda, would you say that there are any, I mean, you already mentioned the Tea Party movement, and would you say that there are any, any other historical expl explanations or maybe uh, other factions within the party that come into play or that we should mention? Well, uh, let me say a couple of, 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 of points that have come up. First, my understanding of the Tea Party is different from Collins. It is true that the elite groups that jumped on the Tea Party bandwagon were uh, so-called fiscal conservatives. Uh, 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 I don't believe that. They've never worried at all about running up deficits through tax cuts. So I would say they were tax cut, anti-regulatory uh, Republicans. Um, who Mitch McConnell, by the way, has masterfully um, managed their agenda and achieved extraordinary gains uh, for them um, under both Barack Obama and uh, Donald Trump. Um, I think Mitch McConnell is arguably, along with Nancy Pelosi, the most effective politician in this period in terms of connecting politics to policy. I don't believe that's all of what politics is about, but if policy gains, including remaking the judiciary, are your thing, Mitch McConnell is a brilliant, brilliant tactician and uh, has been and remains so. Um, the grassroots of the Tea Party were all little Trumpies in the making, almost all of them. They were more passionate about the sociocultural and partisan um, um, makeup of uh, of the country's politics uh, than they were about um, fiscal conservatism. And the split always occurred about things like Social Security and Medicare, and Trump understood that. You know, he promised, even on health care, he promised to give you better health care than Obamacare. Uh, and, uh, you know, people who wanted to believe that believed it. Um, so, I would characterize the split in between Mc, the McConnellites and the Trumpites in the Republican Party, not simply in terms of voter blocks. We've talked about that. And I think the dilemma there is intractable uh, and will depend on whether the Democrats do things that allow uh, those um, independents and suburban Republicans who may only be a fifth of the party, but that's not nothing in close elections to swing back. And that's possible. I just don't know how things are gonna play out economically. I don't know whether Democrats are going to do dumb things like announce defunding the police as a national uh, strategy again. Uh, that Not that the Democrats did that, but groups around them did. And so there's a whole other side to this that is unpredictable. But inside the Republican Party, I would say that it's a fight between the people who would like to continue to manipulate the electoral college. Remember, the fact that America is a federated system means that voting rules, voting access, ballot access, ballot counting rules are set in the states where state legislatures are overwhelmingly Republican in lots of places, including key swing states. The Electoral College itself allows a minority to win the presidency and to control the Senate. And, you know, the Mitch McConnell wing of the party had a great thing going institutionally. It was enabling um, the, the manipulation of voting rules, which has just accelerated for 20 years now in the Republican Party. And the, the perfectly legitimate but hardball use of minority power um, in the Senate and the Electoral College it has been enabling a minority of Americans um, 
to to control a lot of policy making um, going forward. But Donald Trump comes along and he blows all that up to some degree because he's nationalizing everything. He and he, he in the end was remember the moment when Trump and McConnell broke was after the Electoral College in December finally ground through all the court challenges and the this, that's, and the other things in the states and said, you know, there just isn't evidence. And Trump's own attorney general, Bill Barr, said there just isn't any way through this system, this electoral college system, that we can overturn this election. Well, Trump was supposed to say okay at that point. He was supposed to step back and and say, okay, let's go all in to winning the Georgia Senate contest to stop the Biden presidency. Let's, he was supposed to play the game, the electoral college magnifies minority power game, but he refused because for him, it was about a personalizing national control. And so that's the fight and you know, I want to underline that it is truly alarming that a significant proportion of Republican elites are going along with violence. That is a real threat to uh, even the sort of McConnell version of hardball politics. There's a difference between hardball politics that stretches the rules of the game to the limits which Mitch McConnell has been masterful at, and I would argue, and I do argue to my leftist friends who don't like it, that he's just plain good at it and he has every right to do it. There's a difference between that and teaming up with armed militias to threaten local election officials, state election officials, and elected office holders. And that's what the January 6th split is about. And frankly, it is. Everybody in the whole world should be very alarmed that one of the two major political parties in the United States is continuing to play footsie with extra legal violence. Colin, do you want to comment on that? Well, I mean, obviously what happened on the 6th was insane, illegal, outrageous. Uh, a lot of leading Republicans have said so. The whole debate within the party now is to what extent to hold Trump personally responsible for it. Most voters seem to think that he shouldn't be held responsible. And that politically has an impact, as we've said, on House Republicans and Senate Republicans in terms of their willingness to condemn him. Um, in the, but most in the Americans do, right? Yeah, you're gonna get a solid majority saying that uh, Trump, are you, obviously, are you talking about whether people condemn the events of the day or whether they condemn Trump personally? Because either way, you're gonna get a solid majority. That's too narrow a way to put it. First of all, extra legal violence and threat of violence has went on through much of the election outcome denial period. Uh, it's much more alarming, for example, that the Michigan Republican Party has cashiered the one Republican who was prepared to vote to certify the election in that state won by 150,000 votes and uh, and has installed as um, in charge of the party in Michigan, somebody who is still trying to deny that there was actual Trumpist violence on January 6th. It's not all about Donald Trump. There are a lot of ordinary uh, grassroots people out there who watch Fox News and the outlets to the right, and who there's a poll that says close to half of Republican identifiers blame Antifa, the mythical Antifa, for January 6th. And that's not even getting to whether, for example, uh, Republicans in the states who have simply gone along with the norms of, of elections in the current system, which is hardly biased against them, should be threatened with violence and have their families threatened with violence. I don't think that that's played out at all. I think that is an ongoing issue and it is a profound threat to the American system because, you know, good people in the middle and at the edges of the Republican Party and in the Democratic Party are going to say, do I need this? 
Do I need to volunteer for that local board? Do I need to get involved in uh, counting votes? Uh, that's what they're gonna say. Or do I need to run for office when it could bring this kind of threat of excoriation, physical violence with it? And I, I think that that has that genie is out of the bottle in this post-election period in 2020. And it is not about Donald Trump personally. So I'll just, if I could just add two things to that, this is important. So first of all, I think one of the things you saw on the 6th, January 6th, was that in a way, as, as bizarre as that day was, the system functioned in the end, partly because a critical mass of Republicans voted to certify Biden's win. He did, of course, he did win the election. And, it, and if you look at that vote, I'm not talking about the impeachment vote now, but if you look at that vote on that day, the great majority of Republican senators and whatever it was, roughly half of House Republicans, I forget the exact number. No, it was only 40% of House Republicans. Was it 40%? Okay. It was an alarming group. Okay. So that percentage of Republicans in Congress voted to certify. And the other thing that happened in the lead up was that a lot of courts, including Republican judges, just threw this stuff out of court. They said, this is ridiculous, right? So Trump had tried over and over again denying the, the, the electoral result to, to get courts to act in his favor. And he couldn't do it, even with judges that he had appointed. So that's where, an example where the American system, separation of powers actually functioned as intended and, and a good thing too, because obviously you know, Biden won the election. Uh, I will just say to your viewers something that's worth keeping in mind, which is it may not be obvious in Sweden, but what happened last spring and summer in terms of the street violence in the US following the uh, George Floyd affair was truly shocking and alarming to a lot of people. And that was something that also was violent, lawless uh, on a large scale in a lot of cities. Um, in another year, like 1968, that may have tipped the election no. for the Republicans, but for, for a combination of reasons this time, Biden was able to win, you know, for, we can talk about why and how. Um, I think a lot of smart Democrats understood at that moment, spring and summer, that it was possible that a liberal party could blow the election on that issue. Crime, yeah. law and order. I mean, that is, a, that is a third rail issue in this country historically. And I think a lot of grassroots conservatives were honestly stunned by what they were seeing and thought that it would probably help win the election for Trump. It didn't. And so um, what you're seeing now, I, I, I am concerned that there is an increased willingness in this country to rationalize, justify, ignore large scale violence if it's quote unquote political. I think it's a serious concern. It's not completely unheard of in American history, but it's not where we wanna go. You know, I agree with all of that. Um, I do think that one of the reasons that Democrats lost down ballot much more than they expected was because of the reverberating effects of um, the minority of violent forces that played a role in the George Floyd protest. Most of the people were not violent, but there were violent elements that to a shocking degree engaged in property destruction. And also in some cases, particularly Oregon, um, went after uh, public symbols in a way that was not controlled um, for reasons that we would need to get into the police and maybe we better get into the police because the police play a role in all of this that whose contradictions came to the fore on January 6th. And I think a lot of the Trump rioters expected the police to step aside entirely and they did not. That's a misreading of the police, but there are plenty of people on the left who misread the police too and misread the issue of the ties of ordinary middle class and working class Americans, including ethnic minorities, to uh, policing and to police. So um, that, that's a factor. But I just want to stress that there is a very, very big difference between major sectors of an established political party, by which I mean elected office holders and people running for office, uh, blinking at or even openly endorsing 
um, extra legal violence. Uh, that is happening on the right in the United States right now. It happened very, very little on the left. Joe Biden came out and condemned the rioting associated with the George Floyd protests practically the same day that it occurred. He said no to the defund the police slogan, which was one of the stupidest slogans uh, anybody has ever dreamed up that came from white radicals, basically, in uh, Minneapolis, uh, who hadn't even looked to find out whether they could do it. It turns out there's a charter provision that made it impossible for them to even do it. Um, and the research shows that minority communities and working class communities in the United States not only have police officers in their midst, somebody's brother, somebody's cousin, somebody's ch child, they also want the police to be reformed and effective and fair, not absent. <laughs> they're, they're, they call the police for, for reasons that have to do with realities that many upper middle class Americans, including fashionable lefties, do not appreciate. Uh, so that is a very tough issue, but I wanna come back to my key point here. A fair assessment will not show Democratic elected politicians beyond a tiny fraction, even blinking their eyes at that kind of violence, let alone sort of endorsing it. And that is not true right now in the Republican Party. And that's terrifying because the U.S. is a two-party system. Either of these parties can win power. Um, all right, so coming back to where we actually do want to go and to sort of sum this up because we are heading to the end of this webinar, I would like to ask you both, um, what are the issues where you see that the Republicans and the Democrats can uh, or are willing to find compromise in Congress within the next two or four years? And also, what do you think are the most relevant questions to or issues to be looking out for as for the future of the party? Colin, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, there are actually a few issues where you may find common uh, ground in, in Congress. I thought one of the most interesting things that Trump did was to put the idea of big scale infrastructure spending on the agenda. It's not something you would traditionally associate with Republicans, uh, but he actually put it out there and there, there really is an argument for it. From my point of view, especially when it relates to national security concerns vis-a-vis -vis China. And I think that there's now critical mass of Republicans who might be willing to actually vote for that. You're going to get debate over, you know, to what extent do you fund, for example, environmental priorities. But I think you might actually get a bipartisan vote on infrastructure. Uh, I have to say, for the most part, I think you're going to see a polarized Congress for all, all the reasons we've discussed. I mean, the two parties really are polarized. Um, and that's that's very personal. It's not just issue based. But there are these there are these policy areas where Trump has cracked open possibilities, surprisingly for Republicans to actually be less orthodox. Um, and so infrastructure might be one. And then as far as the way forward, um, I think actually Theda and I would probably agree that Trump is unlikely to form a third party. I mean, he's not the personality type to sit down and do the legwork and say, let me form a lasting third party with a Trumpish agenda. That's not his style. But I also think we probably agree that enough Republican office holders are afraid of him that the possibility of getting uh, slapped verbally by Trump is a motivator for them. So in that sense, the, the very threat of it or the possibility of it can continue to make him a force. I think what's more positive and constructive looking forward is how can Republicans respond to valid concerns on the part of so many voters about frustrations over decades really with you know, military interventions that have not worked as planned patterns of globalization that have not worked for middle and lower income Americans as well as promised, uh, trends whereby the People's Republic of China seems to be surpassing the United States in a long-term way as the, as the uh, largest economy on the planet. Um, you know, and you can go down the list. These are legitimate concerns, and then we can debate how to respond to them. But um, Trump, oddly enough, uh, opened up space for that debate on the Republican side. And I think that there are enough people out there who rec recognize that and that are willing to say, you know, we're not going back to George W. Bush. We're probably not even gonna go back to Reagan. I happen to like Reagan. I've written about him very positively over the years, but that era is over. 
It's, we, you know, we're, we are not going back. Hey, yeah. You know, Trump not only opened up space in the Republican Party, he opened up space in the Democratic Party. And uh, I think you're going to see uh, Democrats putting forward an actual infrastructure plan <laughs> that will win a vote, particularly since they have decided to go back to earmarks, which uh, is, a, is a very effective way to uh, handle things in the U.S. Congress. Uh, and I, I saw, I, and on China policy, you see Biden being very cautious about re-embracing any kind of uh, free trade with China. He's going to be equally cautious about doing anything more than the appearance of talking to the Iranians, which Trump himself was willing to do too. So, uh, you know, I think some of these um, tendencies that have been opened up have been opened up in a way that are going to affect debates and policy making in both parties. The difference is that the Democrats actually are serious about governing when they win. And uh, I think you're gonna see uh, a real possibility of bipartisan votes, even in the ridiculous Congress at times, on some of the things Biden is gonna put forward. And even in the immigration, I expect what will happen is the whole thing will get broken up into pieces and some of those pieces will get Republican votes, some Republican votes. Um, so much depends really, you know, we're here we are in a political system where two very old men are defining the, 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 the coalitions in power right now in the two Democratic, in the two parties. Um, and so what happens as they inevitably are not the ones who are defining the, the agendas of leadership going forward. Um, I don't think that's resolved. Um, and uh, so the United States remains in a period of turbulence, polarization, conflict that is very, very high stakes. And that will be true now for at least another 10 years. Uh, I personally am hopeful that at the end of that 10 years, the United States will be a robust multi-ethnic democracy. I think that will have to... I'm not sure. Yeah. And, you know, I, so, so I think that, that this is a period of, of fraught with alternative possibilities that remain just as alive now as they were, if not more so than when Trump won in 2016. For the country and for the party, I suppose. Uh, well, thank you both. This uh, webinar is coming to an end. Thank you, Theda and Colin, so much for sharing this um, knowledge with us. I'm left with uh, so many more questions, but I will have to wait for another time. Uh, thank you to all the audience for watching and for uh, sending me uh, all of your questions. And thank you, Hedvig and Julia, for helping me behind the scenes. On March 19, we will talk about the state of democracy in America. So most welcome to join us then. Thank you everyone for today and have a good night. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone.